Okay. There we go. So today we're going to talk about uh, kind of the next step of um, the customer relationship and then demand creation uh, for your product. And part of this is, uh, as we've been progressing through it, customer problem, uh, you know, how are we going to distribute it through channels uh, and, and that, and now well, how do you actually get customers uh, in there? Uh, you, one thing, uh, and this is for kind of each of your own ideas, as we're moving towards this direction, if you're feeling uncomfortable about your kind of the earlier steps, specifically the customer problem, uh, it kind of gets a little bit tougher because you're like, well, I think this is it, but it, it, you're, you will feel better if you're like, I've nailed my customer value proposition, my, I know who my customer segment is, I know who my, what my value prop is. Um, and it gets kind of tougher as you move towards this demand creation. So as you're doing this, if you're like, boy, this is really kind of tough for me to do, that may be signaling that you're not real comfortable with what your value proposition is. <coughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and from a customer relationship standpoint, the key three key components are uh, getting the customers, keeping the customers, and then growing the customers you have. And we're going to spend more of the discussion right now on this first one, the get the customers, because uh, it's that, that's where you're at. You most of you don't have a real problem of. Well, well, how am I going to, my biggest problem is how I can retain the, all the customers I have right now or, uh, you know, get them to grow, but hopefully that's soon to be a high priority. The, uh, in Blank, by, oh, by the way, I uh, actually did get a chance to talk to uh, Steve Blank at uh, South by Southwest. So, yeah, I went to his talk, which was uh, interesting, and uh, <coughs> chatted with him for a few minutes before we, uh, before he, he spoke, in fact. Um, but I'll, his topic was avoid the Hollywoodification of entrepreneurship. So it wasn't, it had nothing to do with kind of his, his book, actually. It was more uh, avoid entrepreneurship reality shows and the like, because right? that's uh, the direction it seems to be going. Uh, in uh, He uses this funnel, which I think is actually a, a Good one, and he has separate ones for both the physical and the uh, mobile or web worlds of how do we get customers, and then uh, what are the steps you take in getting a customer, and then blowing a kind of a double edged funnel of how do you grow uh, them. So, those three steps. In He talks about in the physical world, you have these steps of going from the awareness that the customer even knows about your product, uh, getting them interested in it so they consider it till they actually purchase it. That it is this funnel of uh, you're going to, your marketing is trying to get them to go through that funnel all the way to buying your product and uh, becoming an actual customer. You also may have uh, some viral loops in there as far as when they purchase this product? Is there some way that that kind of swings back and helps increase awareness of your product? Uh, it's even stronger in the uh, mobile world where uh, you know, you're all on, when you're on Facebook or something that how many friends are now playing Farmville or whatever new obscure app uh, that's get, that you start to get pinged. Uh, you even get some of that in physical space, just someone seeing uh, that new car or that new tennis racket uh, that's, that you're selling. Uh, people are starting to see that, uh, ask, well, hey, where'd you get that? You know, what's so good about it? And next thing you know, you've got the you know, next uh, type of Callaway to driver or some, uh, some physical product that just by even getting people to buy it, you create some uh, viral awareness. So, for physical, you have all those 
intermediate steps to get it to a, a close. Contrasting that to the mobile, kind of web mobile, where you don't have as many of those uh, steps that you can really go much faster from uh, them uh, acquiring a customer and then trying to activate that customer. So you're going to use your, the, from a marketing standpoint, uh, you're trying to just get the word out, get them to let's say, come to your site, and then they're going to either uh, become a customer or not, uh, whatever that hit rate is. And then uh, you have that tighter viral loop where when they become a customer, maybe it, you have that, oh, click here and tell your friends that you're now using this, or, oh, or uh, it may be by default, uh, the classic. Uh, you know, all through LinkedIn, uh, you know, click here and your entire Google Mail address book is going to be invited, uh, something to make it easy for you. Uh, Google Mail on the bottom, uh, you have people telling you what app they're using. Uh, that actually, even uh, the default on your iPad, uh, kind of this was sent from an iPad, this email, or your iPhone. Uh, that's a physical product, but uh, strong viral aspect to it. So when you're looking at uh, the, uh, your, how are you going to create demand? How are you actually going to do this? And you have uh, advertising, which is a traditional uh, way of doing it. Uh, you have a lot of details as far as where are you going to be doing this advertising. It's, is it online? Where are you going to get in front of your customer? Where are they going to hear about your product? Uh, is it something that you're banking on it being a viral product that will go uh, out if you just get a few sales and get it ginned up, it's going to spread like wildfire, uh, and that's how you're going to market it. Uh, we've talked already about, is it going to be through your uh, channel partners? Are you going through a direct sales force? It's going to be PR in the, a lot of the medical fields. It's more of the experts, and the experts may be you're published in a journal somewhere. Uh, that's a key aspect of your uh, demand creation, is going to be getting published by the right uh, science folk or the right medical folks in the right uh, journals uh, and how this your product is actually uh, a good one to use. We'll also have the uh, various influencers that uh, play, uh, play into it and one it, it can be multiple different folks. Um, one example I uh, was out at uh, Nintendo uh, a couple of years ago, right after the Wii had come out. And they talked about when the Wii came out, uh, obviously it was a huge hit, but it was not at all preordained to be a huge hit. Uh, in fact, at that point in time, just before the Wii came out, Nintendo was considered very much an also ran. Uh, it was, if you recall, I think they're the GameCube or something, you know, they had. Uh, most of the industry was saying, you know, these guys should either shut down or sell themselves to Sony or, or Microsoft because uh, they had, in fact, they still have, uh, the technology is definitely a much inferior from a graphics standpoint and speed standpoint relative to the uh, Microsoft Sony options. So when they were coming up with this product, uh, they were coming out with a fairly weak hand. Uh, they didn't have a very good reputation, and they were not viewed as really a serious gaming uh, machine. And they did have this innovation, though, with the nunchucks and the uh, sensor that was different uh, than the <coughs> others. So what they uh, did is they had uh, they said, who are the key influencers that we have to go after? And the uh, first thing they did was uh, at the uh, uh, not Comdex, not Comdex, the uh, CES, Consumer Electronics, I think it was the Consumer Electronics Show where they debuted it. Uh, they had a big ad campaign leading up to it, which was, we're Nintendo, here are all the great things we've done in the 25 years we've been around. You know, we were the very first people to come out with uh, 
a you know the, the game controller mechanism. You know, all their, I'd say their breakthrough thinking. We had the first portable gaming system. Uh, you know, we brought you Mario. This uh, kind of all the stuff that they brought that no one else. They were the first ones to do it. So we've got this lineage, and now the Wii with this new controller is the next step in that. So we're kind of very. Uh, uh, a very serious uh, gaming uh, company, and uh, at the trade show, they wanted the hardcore, uh, hardcore gamers to see that this was uh, a popular uh, place to be. And they, in fact, had said their high point was uh, that people were running through the Sony booth to get to the Nintendo booth when the doors opened, so that they could try out uh, the Wii. And uh, so they. First, want to nail down the fact that you wouldn't be embarrassed as a gamer to have the Wii. That you know, maybe it doesn't have to be your only system, but it wasn't like you you know you had something that was uh, an embarrassment. So uh, to make it okay for the experts, the, the hardcore actually hardcore gamers to have a Wii was acceptable, uh, and they did that through the trade show. Then they uh, realized that the they wanted it to be cool and have a, a very um, that, that it was more of uh, it wasn't it was more popular uh, that who were the influencers I mean, it, this would be a cool thing to have so uh, the folks that they realized are, made it cool were Colbert John Stewart Letterman uh, and the like and they uh, gave they were called the producers of those shows and said we will give you a system and by the way, um, we have this me technology where you can customize the, the character, and uh, oh, we, and we've made one of David Letterman, and uh, we'd be happy to show you how to make some others as well. And lo and behold, you have the Letterman playing uh, tennis against I think it was Venus Williams and beating her on the Wii uh, on the show, which would be for ten minutes, and Colbert. <laughs> Doing the boxing game against Nancy Pelosi, yeah, on the show, which ended up being lots of time, uh, a free, a total free PR, and also, okay, this is a lot of fun. Uh, this is these are the people that are setting the cultural coolness norms, and uh, people for a large swath of, of America, and uh, they're having fun with it. So you had this becoming uh, a very popular. Uh, through that, uh, from a cultural standpoint, uh, they also uh, did a. They moved on to uh, some um, uh, viral, uh, a viral aspect of it as well. Uh, it took a little bit, um, a little bit of time, but they created all kinds of tools for you to blog about your we. Uh, for you to include uh, links uh, to what you were doing, to you, when you could create your own me and share it with your friends. So they wanted this to become a, the community uh, to flourish of people that were interested in the product, and they in turn did uh, by giving them lots of uh, lots of tools to make that easy uh, to happen, and, and so that it would be shared. So that helped to build up the community. Uh, the other very unique thing about the, the Wii was the different demographics, because historically when you said, well, who buys a gaming system? It's like, okay, it's males between the ages of 12 and 28. And, you know, it's like, boom, okay. Uh, everybody knew that. The Wii, on the other hand, since it was a casual gaming system, blew that out of the water, and, and it uh, instead... Uh, if you look at their ads, in fact, uh, they will have uh, a couple cool, de you know, dead-on demographics there, but they'll also have, you know, senior citizens and uh, and um, other and families, uh, because they're from a marketing standpoint, what they wanted, they realized what their value proposition was relative to these other uh, gaming systems wasn't the gigahertz or the uh, graphics uh, resolution, it was that, uh, one, you could play it as a family, because truly grandma could play it as well as uh, junior, and uh, two, you had motion activity, 
And so parents actually viewed it as more of exercise than it really was, but it was more than just sitting on a couch. You actually were moving around. And, uh, and that was really their key value proposition to a much broader target. Uh, they had multiple target segments, but the family was the big one. And their value proposition wasn't the performance, it was those attributes. So if you ever see their ads, they actually are, it's funny, you'll see them showing people, showing Junior losing to Grandma uh, in the game. You'll see um, people sweating because as they're playing the game. Uh, and, and of course having fun uh, as well. But uh, a very uh, different segment. And this was, so they targeted all these different influencers to kind of move their idea uh, forward. Uh, and this is actually a Walmart story that I heard uh, from a past company editor that he uh, said he was down in uh, Fayetteville. Air. That's where it was. Yeah. And the, yeah, Bentonville. Okay. Bentonville. Sorry, yeah. Bentonville. Yeah, uh, Bentonville. And he saw this uh, billboard for duct tape. And he's like, that's kind of weird. I don't, you know, I don't remember I've ever seen duct tape marketed in, in, in such a way. And why would you have a big billboard for duct tape? So he uh, called, a, he knew someone who worked at the company that made this duct tape. So he called them up and said, you know, are you guys doing some unique marketing, new change in strategy? I saw this uh, down when I was down there. And they said, uh, this is a brand of duct tape. And they said, no, no, but the Walmart buyer lives on the active street. <laughs> yeah, I ran past that one. So that's cool. I've actually seen that billboard. I know it's okay. like, yeah, that's kind of funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I actually had the same person. thought. I wondered, I wondered if that was the case. Absolutely is, and you can find out, you can map where they live and <laughs> plant anything you wanted to. Well, you probably, you actually probably um, just could map on uh, Google Maps of, you know, where they live, where they work, and, you know, maybe a clear route to take. They live on the freeway, so they would have had to have taken the freeway if okay. they like. Yeah. So, <laughs> a, a great example of it, kind of N equals one uh, market, but that influence, that is your, if you can, kind of get that buyer bought in, so to speak, uh, it makes a big difference. Uh, the founders of um, Bose did something similar when they were getting launched. That uh, At that point in time, they plotted out how someone decides to buy us, uh, what speakers you buy. And this was back in the I mean, 60s, 70s, so back a ways. You would ask your buddy who is the stereo guy? Because uh, you, know, you didn't just go by; you talked to your, your, you know, whoever your buddy was that was a stereo guy. And where do they get their information? Well, they got it in one of these, you know, five different magazines. That uh, is where they got their knowledge. And of those five magazines, you actually found out that most they're the kind of the great, the godfather of the speakers was in one of the magazines. And it was, you know, this was just literally a person. And this person usually kind of wrote the first review, and it was pretty much parroted by all the other magazines, uh, but was the, the lead one. So they decided this is the person we need to sell to. And uh, they uh, created an entire marketing campaign uh, to get kind of in front, just for this person. Uh, yeah, of what all the attributes that they had that were their advantages and their speaker versus every, any other speaker out there. And it uh, ended up being that they got feedback that he kind of loved this, this, and this about it, but that, oh, yeah, kind of hated this one aspect of their speaker. And realized, okay, it's not, um, it's not, a, he doesn't understand it that well. And we need to correct, get, you know, get them to understand this one key attribute. So they bought a full page ad in the magazine that was strictly focused, and this was the worst ad ever, <laughs> because it was super technical, just addressing this one specific aspect of their uh, speaker, and, but their audience was this guy. And so that he would read it and go, it's his own, it's his magazine, he's going to read it and, uh, to clarify this one key point. 
And then after that, they said, oh, we'd like you to review our, our uh, speaker. And I know it could be you know, various people in your magazine, but by the way, we did just buy that full page ad, and we'll you know, buy some others uh, going forward. And we'd love to have him review it. And said, oh, we can't make any promises, but they did have him review it. And he gave him these 10 out of 10 stars. You know, this is the greatest speaker ever, and it took off. But uh, it was clearly understanding who's the influencer in, uh, in your market. Yeah? So uh, being a smaller canvas, where would you put the influence? Where, which box? Um, then it would be under the customer or demand creation. So how are you going to create demand If uh, is probably where I would put it. Uh, would that be in channels or relationships? Oh, in customer relationship, sorry. Customer yeah, relationship. yeah, it's a customer relationship. Uh, okay. Now, part of this is you need to decide how are you going to acquire these because most of these things cost money. Uh, almost even the, the PR ones of getting a, a review in Stereo Weekly or whatever it was cost them a lot of money because it didn't uh, get it right. I, so, what are you going to do? How are you going to get in front of your customer? And uh, how much do you think it's going to cost you to do that? The, uh, you also, you're going to want to work on a sales message that is, how do you simply explain your idea? So that a uh, customer can uh, learn, to, you know, it doesn't have to explain everything about your idea, but it has to get them at least wanting to learn more, and get them interested to move them down the process. Maybe if it's a simple enough idea, you can get them all agree that, okay, they'll buy it. But a lot of times, you just want them to engage to learn more, and then you can provide them with more information uh, to kind of hook them in. Uh, this is different by, you have multiple customers, so it can be different by different customer segment. They may be attracted to different aspects uh, of the message. I, I talked about uh, the Nintendo. If the message for families was different than the message for hardcore gamers. For the, uh, the hardcore gamers, it was more of, hey, this can be your casual second system. That it's not, you know, oh, we, 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 we know you need to have something that's super high performance for your main one, but this can be when you're just chilling. You're, you're taking a break from the intense video games. This is your relaxation from video games is to play on the Wii. Oh, uh, it's how they positioned uh, the, that, their system relative to uh, the others. And also then it was a very different message than when they were pitching to families in their sales message. If you're doing business to business, quite often you're going to need some type of uh, ROI, white paper type of uh, approach that you can provide them with. Uh, this is how it's going to save you money. Uh, most businesses are more. That's probably the big, big thing that they're driving towards, or whatever, or quality, uh, speed, whatever the business piece is. And having a, a good white paper uh, is a, often a, a key tool in that case, where you lay out what it is, uh, how it works, and how it's going to benefit the company. The even in the, I don't know if you saw this, uh, if people ever did this at Walmart, but I've seen even consumer goods would it create a white paper for the trade. That would, you know, I'm using white paper somewhat loosely where it's talking about the great economics that replacing the three feet of shelf space with our product versus what's there now is going to drive your channel profits up uh, quite a bit. But it's more in depth usually if it's a B2B. The, uh, and this is, um, Steve Blank uh, mentions this, but it's also, it's actually from the guy who wrote uh, Crossing the Chasm, uh, Jeffrey Moore, which uh, if you've ever, is actually a great book if you're ever uh, interested in kind of how technology is diff diffused. Uh, talk, this is this curve of early adapters here, and the kind of main market here, and the laggards here, and they're 
they subdivide it some more. But the point is, in the beginning days, you get these kind of half crazy people that are uh, willing to put up with something that doesn't uh, work real well. Um, but there's no one here that's going to mess around with having to reprogram their Pi to, uh, you know, do, to get it to work and uh, all that. It, it needs to be plug and play. Uh, and if you, you need to cross this chasm of uh, getting something that kind of kind of works to, it works without a problem, without a hitch. So, but it, this is how do you position the product? And it, uh, I, this is something I'll, I'll want you to do for next week is for your product, try to use this template and articulate. You know, if you just put in, you know, for insert target end user here, who wants, needs, what's, you know, why do they want this, uh, or why would they use this, you know, your product is a blank, and what's the key benefit that provides key benefit, unlike competitor and competitor, it could mean an industry that there's nothing else out there. So, uh, you know, your, yours would probably be Google, uh, and uh, and then you know, unlike them, which you know, Google doesn't actually provide uh, a good search result uh, in this space. But this is something that I think uh, you want to take a cut at, probably polish it. And is almost an elevator pitch. It's even less than an elevator pitch. But this is the if someone says, "Oh, what's your business?" <coughs> if you can state this clearly to a potential customer, it it, it goes a long way. It's, they should be pretty quickly like, "Oh, I get it. I get your idea." What does that mean here? They may not believe it, but at least get it. Yeah. Does it have to go in this order? Um, the book does suggest that it goes in, in, in sequence. It, yeah, it does. But what are you thinking? Like, because they say like my my for tax badgers. Like tax badger is for these people who want this, you know. And, and it it makes one really long statement, and ultimately they want you to get down to maybe a much shorter sentence, but use this as the building blocks. Yeah. So I think for purposes of getting down to that sentence, they want you to use this, but. This is a pretty key format that's been used in a lot of modern marketing uh, methods. I think Deb Mitchell used to teach brand woven, and this component was a very strong component of the core building block of really focusing the vision yeah. of your organization really almost boiling down, helping you understand what you're all about mm -hmm. and making sure that what you're all about really is what you really want to be all about. So this, this and this, having to boil it down into a statement that's stated in this way is a pretty, pretty compelling actual yeah. way to do it. But, and I think it, would you say? Yeah. Okay. The marketing folks have, uh, <laughs> Got it. spoken. See you all. Uh, some people have different thoughts on it too, but yeah. I don't know. To me, it was it was pretty. Yeah, I mean, I thought it forces it, you to think. Yeah, it for it, it's a good point. It forces you to think and to address um, these. If you can address all of these, I think you actually have a pretty clear uh, argument of what you're all about, what your idea is all about. Because uh, that is one area that often entrepreneurs have the problem of they kind of have the idea in their head, yeah. but. How do they articulate it? Is quite and, and the other reason why I like a positioning statement um, is because it, it grounds you in the strategy. So, like when you're thinking about all of your marketing mm -hmm. tactics, you know it either aligns with this or it doesn't. You know, as opposed to just throwing a bunch of stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks, yeah. um, being really confusing to consumers. It, it grounds you in, like this is where we're going to go. Yeah, and I think it actually probably covers a lot of the. If we look at the, if we use the uh, um, business canvas, it's using the, your target customer segment. It's using the value proposition. It's adding in this competitive uh, component as well. So, uh, you know, it's probably more it's more of a verbal version of a, that graphic. Another useful market is more of an advertising uh, tool. Uh, I'm curious if they, 
into this and grab open, but we're trying to get down to your core idea of the rule of asking why five times. And uh, that if you keep asking regarding an idea, well, why would someone do that? Or why, why would the customer care? Uh, it, it, you start to kind of get down to um, uh, the fundamental reason. Uh, this was an idea, uh, actually a student had uh, last year of fiberglass manhole covers. Instead of the cast iron ones, it was fiberglass, and you can say, "Okay, well, why is you know why is that a good thing?" And say, "Well, it's because their um, cast iron ones are expensive and risky." Well, why are they expensive and risky? Well, because people steal them, and then in schools, because they, they're you thought the target was going to be not so much roads, because people tougher to steal one on University Avenue, uh, but it's pretty easy to steal one in the playground at an elementary school at night because there's no one there. So, uh, and then, well, and children will get injured, well, because they fall in the, in the uh, sewer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like where the story's going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the school gets sued, and then, well, okay, well, why did, you know, why uh, do they care? Well, the superintendent will get fired if they get sued, and then, you know, the, the superintendent will be without a job and start so you, uh, you know, that's why they're when you call in that school, they're going to care about this. And that's your customer. And it's not just the school cares about it; it's that superintendent. His life's on the line. His life's on the line. <laughs> and uh, and that's what you're selling. That's actually what you're selling in this example is risk abatement and the old, you know, fear uh, fear cells as well. And so you're trying to prevent the. Uh, this outcome. Uh, the that person who told me this said actually all you do this deep enough. If you, you, you ask why five times, uh, you well two things. You do that and it will always end up either in an outcome that's um, preventing death or allow you to appropriate. So it's one of the two human conditions uh, that all ideas will result in. Uh, yeah. Both of those are survival of yourself. Ex <laughs> exactly. So, said, you know, we'll get down to that. And uh, then, uh, but then from a marketing stand advertising standpoint, you get it down to the simplification, and then you kind of build it up. And you you simplify, this is simplify, and you amplify through your marketing message. But you want to have something simple that you're amplifying first, so it doesn't get muddled. I uh, couple. Other just very um, basic ways to communicate if you're talking to a customer uh, of your product. Uh, if you have a simple matrix of cost and whatever the benefit might be of you and other competitors, where you, know, you want to be low cost, high benefit, and showing where the others aren't. Benefits can be lots of different things. It depends on what your, your product is. Uh, it could be quality, it could be Access speed, you know, what what have you? And this uh, this is if you're um, thinking almost like a white paper, or you're, you're trying to communicate to a, a potential customer. Uh, you have different attributes, the price, just the comparison, you know, who has the advantage uh, in, in that? You have multiple competitors. Uh, what are the attributes that people care about? You go with those. So next week, a couple things uh, for the assignment. Uh, assess, it's a good time to really assess your um, value prop and target customer fit. Do you feel good about that? And, you know, and if, if not, you probably should say, okay, I need to do probably a fairly drastic pivot or abandon it based on what I've learned. And that's uh, because it gets tougher and tougher if you have a shaky foundation. As you get further, further down, uh, it's uh, it's become more of a, a challenge if you don't feel good about your value proposition, customer fit. And as I've, uh, I think I've told everyone when we uh, when I talk met with you one on one, too, this every year we have ideas that fall by the wayside, which is 
natural in this, and usually the person uh, gravitates towards another team. Uh, so if you're not feeling like your idea is one that you want to invest a lot more time and effort in because it's that value proposition doesn't match uh, your target customer, uh, that would be, this would be a, kind of a good time to either do a fairly drastic pivot on the idea or uh, abandon that idea. And, uh, there are a lot of other good ideas uh, that you may be interested in helping push forward for the next uh, month and a half. And I'm sure people would be happy to have the added help uh, in a lot of these ideas. Uh, continue talking to customers, channel partners, and test your, um, do a little test on your, of your marketing strategy, which is uh, based on your idea Actually, uh, create the, create that little. Um, sorry, okay. There he is. It, actually, do some marketing. And if you've got something, you know, spend ten bucks on Facebook, or uh, spend uh, you know a couple bucks on some Google AdWords, or create a uh, a um, marketing piece that you think you could use to send out to uh, customers uh, that would articulate what your idea is. Uh, but just play around with, you know, even if it's not, you know, it's not much money, just to test to see if, well, if I do put this out on um, Facebook, which uh, segments would I target? Uh, which, uh, who would I go after? Yeah. Is that dangerous to do, depending on where you are with your house? Well, um, what I would do is, um, Depends what your minimum viable product is. So, if you've got a concept of, um, I, you, I mean, you're not going to sell my screen right now, uh, but would you say click here and just to see how many people click through? Maybe take their email down, get their email down, and even if it doesn't happen, uh, it would be interesting to see what uh, if you get anyone to click through with the idea, even if it goes to a, a blank page. Uh, that's uh, yeah. gotcha. that, that's, actually, that's uh, they sometimes call this the is it the 404 test? Isn't that the error when one yeah. page not found? Yeah. That oh, yeah. uh, it's that you just want to know that people actually clicked on your ad. Yeah. Okay. Because then you've proven that it works. Now, I would probably say you could add, you could maybe capture more value uh, if you had somewhere they landed somewhere. Maybe they give you your their email or something, but at least you know how many people click it through to it. Um, that is insightful. Yeah. Uh, and because that, as you go forward, you're also going to find, often you find out that the uh, messages are, it's tougher to get people, you think people will, oh, everyone will click through because they love this. Uh, but uh, it's, it's one tougher to do that. And you know, I've done some Facebook advertising, which I've not had very good percentage uh, click through, but uh, it's interesting to think about in Facebook who your target audience is, is actually very, kind of very interesting given all the different demographic and info uh, and psychographic aspects you can play with in Facebook uh, just to kind of click on them and find out, wow, how much will they charge me to have my ad show up on the right hand side? Uh, and, and who would I really go after? Who's my target customer? I, I did some of this when I was when we were marketing for um, the uh, entrepreneurship MBA. So it's like, well, now who's you know, who's likely in this whole grand world of, of ours that would come back for an MBA? It's like, well, they're probably you know, these ages. I know they've got an undergrad. They probably have some type of you know Wisconsin link. Yeah, it's not. Uh, so maybe they're already a Badger fan, they're already a Packer fan, you know, they have, you, want, you can pull all that in and maybe that'll be reason enough for them to uh, look at Wisconsin or, or have an interest in entrepreneurship because they're actually one of the other big drivers. So you can kind of give that a test. As I said, if it's consumer, I think doing something on uh, a paid search or Facebook's a uh, fun thing to try. Uh, if you're business to business, you may want to do some more kind of marketing marketing piece that you would, you know, when you're doing a sales call, you'd hand it to someone. So for next uh, class, kind of similar, um, 
I would also ask you to add your cumulative number of customers you've talked to. We've been having, I think that's actually going to be for some of you a pretty impressive number uh, as far as how many people you talked to in the one last week, but then as you go forward. Uh, any updates to your business model canvas? <coughs> your, kind of, your product positioning statement? And then uh, talk about, if I remember, test you ran and what you learned from that. Okay. That's it. Oh, five minutes early. Oh, uh, <laughs> any questions? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a little early. I guess it's about a month and a half out. Yeah. Uh, but would you want to provide, maybe like next week or the week after, or the week after that, since spring break, yeah. information on what our presentation should be like for the Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking that. I yeah, I have that on my list. And it should have queued next week. I yeah. I wanted to just have So we can talk about a little over it. Yeah. Uh so I'll have that. I should have that next week. Yeah. 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 Okay. Very good, everyone. Thank you. Have a good weekend. By the way, is this letter done Google AdWords before you get like a hundred dollars?